Mr. Jared Cohen. He's been with us physically, I think, twice, if I remember well. But he will be reaching us virtually today. He has a very interesting background, but this is how I will introduce him. Uh, Mr. Cohen is the New York Times uh, best, uh, the New York Times best-selling author of five books. Also, he has been named to Times Magazine's 100 Most Influential People uh, for a Policy Top 100 Global Thinkers at Vanity Fair New Establishment. Welcome, Jared, back to the platform. Thank you so much for, for having me back. I, w I wish I was there in, in person, Pastor Poja. You, you know, as we've spoken many times, that the energy uh, that I get from the group that you bring together um, is very much worth the trip. Um, unfortunately, COVID has gotten in our, our way this year, but I promise to, to, to be back in person in the future. All right. Before I get into the questions, let me just ask you, give you about five minutes, maybe just to give some overview right now on uh, global geopolitics, what's going on, the movement as China, America, as it relates to Nigeria. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, I think that what we see playing out globally right now is a new kind of rivalry between democratic systems and authoritarian systems in the context of in the context of COVID-19. You know, before COVID-19, the, the, the ideological battle was a battle between you know, the virtues of a closed system and the virtues of an open system. So in the, contact, and in the context of business and tech and investment, China was making an argument um, that a closed and authoritarian system um, could produce a technological ecosystem um, that's as robust, if not more robust, than the American one. And by the way, that, that, that's, that's largely proven they, 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 they've proven to, to not just be a rising power when it comes to technology. China has proven to be both a peer of the United States and in some cases have surpassed. So if you look at China today, they're producing five times the number of software engineers at, as America at the same level of quality. Um, they're ahead of the United States in uh, payments, uh, e-commerce, voice recognition, 80% of the commercial drone market. Um, they're about 60% of the AI research papers last year, top AI research papers last year uh, came from China. We're about 50-50 uh, in terms of uh, mobile, uh, mobile phone manufacturing. Uh, they got roughly 40% of venture capital uh, money worldwide invested um, into China last year. So they're, they're, a, they're a serious technological player and they've done it with a very different system. Now, the, um, the argument that, that, that we would make in a democratic society in the US is uh, we adhere to a set of rules and, and, and values that, that, that you know, produce a very different type of technology without the back doors and uh, without the sort of compromises to privacy and so forth. So it's, it's, it, it's a battle between two technological powers in the world. I don't think it's a Cold War. Um, I think the Cold War analogy is faulty because during the Cold War, the Soviet Union um, and the United States were not so integrated. Um, but you have two technological powers that are offering something very different, right? So China is basically offering, you know, um, something bigger and faster. Uh, um, the U.S. is offering something that takes a little bit longer, but in my opinion, is more comprehensively better um, for the average user. Um, this may change in the next 10 years. I think that the TikTok experience was a, a watershed moment because before TikTok, I would have said there's no American that will choose a social media platform made in China over a social media platform made in the United States. And that was true until TikTok. It turns out that, that um, they really liked the product and that has resulted in all the sort of complexity that you see today. So that was before COVID-19. In the era of COVID-19, something very different is happening, which is um, the authoritarian systems are able to respond to COVID-19 with a greater level of efficiency for all the reasons that we understand about a centralized system. Um, democracies are looking inward as opposed to multilaterally. Um, and China is capitalizing on that situation to basically make an efficiency argument and shift the paradigm from open versus closed to efficient versus inefficient. And that has profound implications for, for technology. All right. First question I'm going to ask you this well, morning where you're afternoon here. 
Um, because of globalization and the economies of, state, of scale, product, products like rice from China and software from India can be made available more cheaply in Nigeria than made in Nigeria alternatives. How does a relatively young nation like Nigeria in trying to win itself of oil, finding areas to develop competitive advantage in, to what degree might closing our economy for a period of time hold the answer? So the only reason to, to, to close your economy is if COVID-19 or something related mandates it from a, a public health perspective, but closing your economy is never a, a, an effective path to, to competitiveness. Um, you know, we, we benefit from uh, integrating, right? Because you're, uh, you want to be part of the marketplace of ideas. Um, you uh, want to understand markets abroad, participate in markets abroad, um, have others invest in your country. You want to compete with foreign companies in your own country as well as, as abroad, because again, that competition fuels much greater innovation. Um, but, but back to your question, Pastor Poju, I have always thought that Nigeria's greatest asset um, was not its oil, um, not its natural resources, but the extraordinary human capital um, that exists in that country. You, you, you have several things going for you. One, just the sheer size of the population. Two, the diversity of, of, of the population. Again, you know, you know, diversity is another great recipe for, for innovation. But three, you know, I've been to Nigeria, I think six times in my life, maybe, maybe more, maybe seven. Um, including once visiting um, the, the, the platform many years ago. Um, I have never encountered, and I really mean this, I've never encountered a more entrepreneurial population in my entire life. I, I've never had more people come up to me pitching me a business idea, more people coming up to me pitching a new technology, more people asking me insightful questions. And by the way, when I say people pitching me a business idea, I don't mean it in an annoying way. These are like good business ideas. Um, you, know, um, you know, it's just a lot to take in at like eight in the morning, um, you know, every, every single day when you're there. But the, 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 the ideas per capita in, 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 in Nigeria are extraordinary. So I think that the best investment Nigeria can make is uh, to ask itself the question, um, how did it end up with a population that is so disproportionately entrepreneurial? Um, what were the ingredients that were responsible for that? How do we double down on it? Um, and then ask the question, what is getting in the way of entrepreneurs in Nigeria um, being able to have their breakthrough moments? But continue, continuing to invest in human capital is, is a much better strategy for Nigeria than closing its economy. And I would argue that the mixture of investing in human capital and keeping your economy open and flexible um, you know, is, is the right recipe. All right. Um, now, we invited you, it's 60 years of Nigeria, and we want to have an international perspective on something. And particularly, this has to do with um, the global tech ecosystem. The Nigerian tech startups reportedly received $643 million last year which we see as a ray of hope, but that's less than 0.5% of what U.S. startups raised, less than 2% of what Indian startups raised, and less than 10% of what Israeli startups raised, even though Israel has 20 times fewer people than Nigeria. So Nigeria's startup ecosystem is still essentially investment starved. How critical, and that's the question, or this is the question, is capital in driving growth in a tech ecosystem, and how might we catalyze capital for our own ecosystem? It's, it's a great question, and, and of course, capital is extremely important, particularly that seed capital where for a young entrepreneur with a great idea, um, that seed capital is the difference between whether they do it um, or whether they, they, they don't do it. So seed capital is very important. Um, the, good, the good news is um, you don't need a lot of seed capital to, to start a business. Um, 
Look, I think that there's a couple ways to attract more capital into Nigeria's technological ecosystem. Um, the first is what I call the demonstration effect. Right? There's, no, there's no reason Estonia, for instance, should get the kind of um, attention and investment in a country of 1.6 million people that, that it gets. Right? It, it, the, the reason Estonia gets the kind of attention that it gets is because they had Skype. Right? They, they had a successful, they had a big win that was very visible, that's known to everybody globally. With that came more investment. With that came more innovation. And then they used their small size to their advantage. Um, so what I would say, small countries in some cases, that they're able to do certain creative things, like play around with kind of flexible regulatory environments and so forth. Nigeria is not a small country, so you have to play to your strengths, which is you have you know, a lot of people. Um, uh, you um, have, you know, English as um, a, a dominant language. Um, you have uh, high levels of, of human capital and, and talent, but you also have a, a very wealthy um, uh, ecosystem of private sector people. Um, you know, they might be in, you know, the natural resources industry or the cement industry and whatever else. There, there, there has to be pressure on the part of those who have made it in Nigeria, who are still in the country as well as abroad, uh, to want to invest in Nigeria's um, technological ecosystem. So that's the, that's, the, that's the second, which is you have to rally those who have already been successful. Um, this happens in, the, in, in, in you know, the US and Europe all the time, which is people have success in you know, kind of very analog businesses, and then um, they kind of get a, a second win taking their, their, the money that they've, they, they, they've made and investing it in tech, but they do it because they make money, um, right? You know, you know, so, so you have to find a way, and this, this gets back to the point about early wins. You know, Nigeria has had plenty of wins, right? There's, there's plenty of good things coming out of Nigeria. The key is to organize the successes um, and showcase those successes to the su most successful members of the business community outside of tech. Um, third is continue putting pressure on, on um, the government for a flexible, uh, uh, flexible regulatory environment, continue putting pressure on the government to reduce corruption. Uh, one of the biggest impediments to foreign investment um, in a country is a perception that it's hard to invest legally. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I overheard a little bit of the panel before. Um, I know this is something that Nigeria is always working on, but, but um, you know, continuing to, to uh, on the policy front, invest in reducing corruption, I think will, will be positively correlated with attracting um, more investment. And then Nigeria has a number of uh, incubator models, um, which are very, which are very effective. I, I love the incubator model because what it does is it pools talent together and drives down startup costs. Um, you know, and, and the incubator model is a, a group of entrepreneurs, you know, have a shared space. The incubator owns, you know, gets equity in their companies as a result, um, but they're then not incurring um, some of the initial startup costs. So I, I really encourage Nigeria to not just double down on the incubator model, um, but also experiment with some new models that maybe, um, that maybe haven't been tried. Um, and you know, for any entrepreneur in Nigeria who's successful, um, think of yourself as a pioneer for the tech sector in your own country. Um, if you are one of the early ones to be successful, um, you have a responsibility to um, stay engaged with Nigeria's technological ecosystem so that more entrepreneurs can follow you. So if you look at the story of the United States, right, you know, Elon Musk, for instance, was successful with PayPal. Um, Elon Musk didn't then, you know, leave the United States and, and go elsewhere and, and invest elsewhere. Elon Musk, you know, took his success from PayPal um, and invested back um, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And as a result, you know, he, he has Tesla, he has SpaceX, um, and a number of other things. So, so you, you want um, a self-reinforcing technological ecosystem where success begets more success. All right. Next one, I want to ask, given the increasing mobility of high-skilled labor globally, uh, we are seeing in Nigeria young, brilliant professionals from developers to doctors relocating to nations like Canada, UK, Germany, and Australia in greater numbers. What is a talent strategy that you have seen work in circumstances similar to ours anywhere in the world? Have you seen anything in terms of uh, talent strategy on how to tap into your talent? So I think Nigeria has um, has an advantage in this regard, um, you know, because 
you you have such a vast diaspora, um, and for most countries, that diaspora is concentrated in you know two to three countries around the world. I mean, I've been to over 100 countries, and, and the one thing all those countries have in common is there's a lot of Nigerian citizens living in them. Um, so so that's a, think of that as an asset, right? Because what that means is those are kind of like, you know, the, the, each member of the diaspora, particularly in the business community, um, has two potential roles that they can play. One role is they can be ambassadors and evangelists for the, the, the successful uh, story of technology in Nigeria, and you want to enlist the diaspora. If they're already living abroad, um, you know, some of them will come back, some of them won't come back, but if they're living abroad, you know, make them part of the Nigeria story. Um, and, you know, there, so one strategy that works is making sure that the Nigerians who live abroad are equipped to tell that story um, and, you know, can, can function as proper ambassadors and evangelists for, for, for what Nigeria has to offer in terms of technology and human capital. And then the second is all the Nigerians living abroad are plugged into other markets, um, right? So, 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 you know, that has a kind of business intelligence value, for lack of a better way of putting it, right? They're seeing, you know, they're living in Europe, they're living in other parts of Africa, they're living in the United States, they're living in Latin America, they're living in Asia, they're living in China, they're living in Australia and elsewhere. Um, you know, they're seeing innovation on the ground in different countries and uh, those insights can be fed back into Nigeria. But what you, what you really want is, you know, a member, the, the ideal scenario is somebody who's a member of the diaspora identifies a market gap um, in, you know, name your European country or in the United States. Um, and they feel incentivized to go fill that market gap by going back to Nigeria and building the company there. So why would they want to do that? Well, you know, is long, you know, first of all, members of the diaspora, you know, oftentimes feel a sense of patriotic duty. So, you know, they're, they're willing to embrace the, the lowest possible bar that doesn't get in the way of their livelihood. I find that members of the diaspora, they want to go back, they just need a reason to go back. So one reason to go back could be, you know, that's where the capital is. Um, so you could imagine creating a fund, um, you could imagine creating a fund um, to support, um, you know, uh, members of the diaspora coming back tonight, you know, it, it, for members of the diaspora who want to build a company um, with international appeal, um, you could imagine a, seed, a, a fund to give them, you know, sort of seed rounds if they build their company um, in Nigeria with Nigerian employees. You could even imagine an incubator devoted entirely towards attracting the Nigerian diaspora back to Nigeria to build uh, the company. Um, and these don't just have to be companies that, that focus on things that Nigeria needs. There, there's no reason that a, a company in Nigeria can't build something that is solving a problem in Australia or solving a problem um, somewhere else. So, so, so I think a big part of um, reducing the brain drain um, and restoring the brains that have been, have been lost to other countries um, is uh, giving the entrepreneurs who are living abroad an opportunity to build something global, but in Nigeria. And they have to feel like they have a better opportunity to do it there. So again, access to capital, access to talent, um, you know, flexible, you know, regulatory environment, anything that gives them an edge, um, they'll come back to, to Nigeria. If it's easier to do in Nigeria, they will do it there. If it's harder to do in Nigeria, they want to build a successful business, so they're likely going to stay where they are. All right, one more. Um, as we look at some of the key challenges on the continent, in your opinion, what emerging technologies present the best opportunities for positive impact? That's in Africa. What steps can be taken by us to harness these opportunities? Um, so I'll give, you, I'll give you two answers. I, think, I still think that payments is, uh, is a sweet spot. For, um, for the African continent, um, in, in, in part because I think this is organically what's happening anyway. Um, there, there's, so much, um, there's so much need in terms of financial inclusion. Um, the, the sort of digital infrastructure challenges that you have um, across the continent are not as much of an impediment. Um, there's both high-end technology, medium-end technology, and low-end technology. Um, ways of doing payments, as, as you've seen from, from, from Kenya to Nigeria. Um, and, um, and it's something that governments actually have some agency over, um, you know, because so much of it is, is regulatory. And I think the real opportunity for Sub-Saharan Africa in particular is instead of having 54, 55 
you know, you know, countries that each have, you know, five or six, you know, um, contained payment solution. I, I think the real opportunity for the continent is a sort of, you know, trans country, um, you know, payment play that becomes the envy of the world. Um, and I think that there, there, if, if, if there's one continent where I think this could happen at scale in a really remarkable way that would transform uh, the lives of every single individual, I really think it's Africa. I've seen it. And I've, been to, I've been to 42 countries um, on the continent. Um, and I come away from every single country with the same conclusion, which is the people in this country are better equipped to think about payments, innovate around payments, and do something interesting with payments than they are in just about any other country and really do it in a way that matters and serves the consumer. Um, in Nigeria, I'd be remiss if I didn't go back to the language point because I think this is really important. So much of the future of AI um, is driven by who has the best data, how well that data is annotated, but it all comes down to training data sets. Um, and given the size of the Nigerian population, again, English is a, as, a, as, a, as a dominant language, um, the, the talent of the people. There is a huge, huge opportunity in Nigeria to be the continent's leader in artificial intelligence um, and also a leader in the world in artificial in, in intelligence. So, um, so, so make sure that the investment at the education level in training for, you know, types of software engineers that specialize in machine learning is happening. Make sure that you, you look at the rest of the world and how it's been grappling with AI and get ahead of some of the challenges um, uh, so, so that Nigeria can learn from the mistakes of, of, of other countries. Um, so, so those are two examples of where I think the continent can really seize the moment and Nigeria in particular can really seize the moment. Thank you, Mr. Jerry Cohen. Thank you so much for the time you spent with us today. Hope to Thank see you. you I enjoyed it. All right. Then. All right. Our next uh, speaker is Aruna Ote.